Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. Thank you very much. The, uh, it's a fascinating thing to not know what's being said about you before you go on stage. And so there is the possibility that right at the end, he said, and don't forget, at the end of the evening, we will kill all the heretics. So um, this is... Uh, I, I'm going to start off by, I'm not a scientist, so this is a very, very important thing for you to know. You don't need to take notes. It's highly possible the things I say may well be wrong. Uh, I am very curious, though. This is a thing that I've been very lucky. I have made a living from being fascinated in the world, and this is kind of what I want to talk about for some of you may well be scientists, some of you may well be studying science, some of you might just be interested. And that, to me, is an important thing. Yesterday, I went to the National Gallery. I saw so much Bulgarian art that I had never seen before from the 20th century. And it was magnificent, and it was exciting, and there were visions that were so different to visions that I'd seen before in other art galleries. And sometimes, we, that woo is correct, the, uh, sometimes we make these divisions. Here is art, here is science, here is philosophy. But the thing that connects all of those things, every single painting, every single statue, every single idea that I may well talk about today, so many of the ideas of science and philosophy, they come from curiosity. They come from saying, why is that? Why does that look like that? Why is that over there doing that? Why do we do this as human beings? So the first picture I've got here, this is just the kind of excitement that happens in my life. I, uh, th this is uh, actually, um, that is uh, the, the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank. I don't know if any of you have had the chance to go to Jodrell Bank. Uh, it is the magnificent thing. That is myself and Brian Cox standing in the middle of the dish of this radio telescope that has helped us interrogate the universe. And when you stand in that dish, you can't help but have a kind of psychosomatic feeling that you can almost feel the radio waves going into you. You can almost feel these things that are being detected, these wonders, things like pulsars, you know, the, these possibilities, as you might know. Every now and again at Jodrell Bank, they think they might have picked up signals of alien intelligence. And then 10 minutes later, they found out that it was just someone in the next door kitchen microwaving a moussaka. <laughs> but for those 10 minutes, there was tremendous excitement. And who's not to say the moussaka is sentient? So I wanted to also talk about the fact that myth and wonder are all part of this. We have to be very careful. Like this, this here is, in, in fact, uh, in, in Roberto's uh, talk, he was talking about areas of, uh, of dark sky, and that's actually from the Outer Hebrides. That's uh, very near Stornoway. Uh, that is a place that on that map was a place of dark sky. And when I first went there, the only time I've been there, I looked up at the sky. And you know that experience you have on a really clear night, when there's maybe you're you know, out in the countryside or up on a mountain or a hill, and you look up, and first of all, you see quite a few stars, and then you keep staring, and more and more stars come into focus. And it's an incredible thing, because the sky looks packed, and yet, of course, all of those stars are enormous distances away. So I was there. The thing you can see there is uh, the Stones of Kalanish. The Stones of Kalanish are older than Stonehenge, and they are wonderful. They're slightly more erratic. They're made of Genesian rock, which uh, is rock with many kind of crystals and minerals in it. And I was very lucky. The day that I went was the only sunny day in the whole of February in Scotland, right? For the first 25 days, it had poured with rain. On the 27th and 28th, I almost couldn't leave the island because it was pouring with rain. But on that day, on the 26th, it was actually, the sun was coming out, it was playing off the rocks. You got this sense almost that the rocks themselves were moving as those kind of, the, the shapes seemed to change. And I was very lucky. I had the whole stones for my, to, just to myself. And what I did was there's a stone called the hand stone. Not because of touching the hand, but it is actually also shaped, not dissimilar to a hand. And I just couldn't help but feel that I was going to just put my hand on that stone. And I had this experience, and I want to make this clear, that to me one of the most important things about being curious is that the more stories that we have, the more ideas we can play with in our head, the more we approach the, what might initially appear to us to be unusual or even sometimes unattractive or opaque ideas, the more of those things we approach, the more ideas we have, the more connections we are making all the time.
And so that moment there when I touched that rock, I had this sense suddenly of all of the time that had passed before. I had that sense as I touched the rock of all those other people who had stood exactly where I was standing, touching that rock. Some of them in Wellington boots, some of them barefoot, some of them in sandals, some of them with no gods in the sky, some of them with many gods in the sky. And I just had this rush of that sensation of layered time. And some people may well say, oh, that was a mystical experience. That was an experience the rock itself was, was feeding all of its energy into you. And that's fine if you want to think that. I, I, I think any way that we... For me personally, what happened was I had filled my mind with so many different ideas that at that moment of contact, it was like they all just suddenly exploded out and they echoed in my head and suddenly I was, uh, I was thinking about Einstein. I was thinking about the block universe. I was thinking about the wonderful idea that moments in time, we sometimes imagine that, that time kind of moves like this, that we move through time and the past disappears and we keep rushing towards the future, but we are always there running in the present. But Einstein's block universe idea is this idea that those moments in time, unlike in Blade Runner, they don't disappear like tears in the rain, those moments in time remain in the block universe. Now, unfortunately, due to the laws of physics, damn those laws of physics, we are not able to return to those moments. But the idea that those moments are still there, I think gives us a tremendous moment of sometimes when, we, sometimes when we're mourning, sometimes when we feel lost, sometimes when we're thinking of the happiest moment we had in childhood, to think that that still exists within the block universe, I think is something wonderful. And it, like geological time as well. When you, when you look, sometimes you might see something like the Rift Valley. And there in geological time, you see that time machine of just going back. And each layer goes further back in time. Uh, now, this was, I was just going to show you also, this is another very important thing. The stones of Kalanish, of course, are something that are known for being wonderful and marvelous. But the thing is to keep your eyes open all the time. These are photos that I've taken the three days before uh, I came over here. Uh, there's just a few of them. There's a lot more than this. That was from a museum I went to. That's a memento mori looking at the idea of life and death uh, in the Welcome Collection. This, right, this is nothing special in one way. What's this? It's just the wall a wall of, of, of a bridge that is going into Euston Station in London. So that's not like the stones of Kalanish, but I looked at that wall because I was stuck. I, the train had stopped. It wasn't going into the station because one of the great things about the United Kingdom since Brexit is uh, the crumbling infrastructure increases. Um, but that gives you a lot more time to look at things because you're not going anywhere. And when I looked at that, I thought of something, something wonderful. Because what I'm witnessing there is the tenacity of nature. Here was a wall. Here were bricks that were saying, we human beings are creating this geometry. This is structure. But in every little gap in the structure, nature found its way of growing out of it. And so always, every time we try and place order, disorder occurs as well. And so I just found that fascinating, that alone, just staring up at the sky, suddenly I see that, that to me interested me. I saw that door, the greenness of that door, it just seemed so green, so I took a photo of that. Then I saw a squirrel that was in the corner there with the flowers around it. That again seemed something fascinating and beautiful. That was a door that didn't open, what lay behind it, I don't know, but that again was something that interested me. And then that was just, that's a toilet in Bethnal Green Library. I was just impressed with the design. So. That's Brian Cox, drinking. Um, now, this is one of the things that I want to talk about of our experience. It's very important for us to be aware of something, which is that we are none of us in a privileged position to objectively experience the world. Every one of us has a subjective experience of the world. Of course, what science attempts to do is be as objective as possible. A phrase we've used many times on the infinite monkey cage, which is to say that science is not necessarily the right answer. What science is, is the least wrong answer with the current technology and ideas we have. So it always keeps moving on. And sometimes you will get people who are kind of anti-science or pro-pseudo-science who will say, they'll come up with something, they go, oh, well, scientists got that wrong. And then you say, oh, they did, you're right. Who found out that scientists got that wrong? Oh, scientists. All right, okay, there we go. We've dealt with that then. 
But it is important to be aware of the fact that our emotional mind and our... So the reason I've got a picture there of Brian Cox sniffing wine, Brian really knows about wine, right? He, he loves wine. He's the kind of person, if any of you have been at a wine tasting, there are certainly, you know, you have to spend a lot of time not drinking, going, mmm, mmm, mmm. Oh, I'm getting a kind of buttery mash. Mmm, yes. And burnt toffee. Are you getting, oh, I'm getting, and they do all this, right? There's a lot of ritual involved in it. So he knows his wine. He spends quite a lot of money on wine. We did a show in Adelaide, Australia, uh, with, it was with Brian, it was with Brian Schmidt, the Nobel Prize winner who also owns a vineyard, it was with the musician and comedian and composer Tim Minchin. All of them really know their wine. I don't really know, I like wine, but I'm basically a wine idiot, really, which saves a lot of money. And uh, <laughs> so this is a thing that many of you may well consider this extremely counter-instinctual. If you do not know the color of the wine you're drinking, if you don't know whether it's white or red, it's almost impossible to tell whether it's white or red. Now, I would say that the majority... Who, who thinks that sounds unlikely from their experience? Just out of interest, that's... Yeah, so that's kind of... I was told you drank wine. Good, good, good. This is, um, this is an important thing, because uh, to me it did. Even though I'd read about this in the past, I still thought, well, you can tell. There's a kind of the rich berryness, you know, the cinnamony elements of the red wine, the cleaner kind of the white wine, the fresher taste of that, gooseberries, whatever it might be. And then we did the test, and no one got it right. We guessed white was red, and red was white. And it was an inc what was great was the moment that Brian and Brian and Tim got it wrong, they couldn't just accept they were wrong. They had to go, no, ah, well, actually, that's a bit unfair. No, no, because you said, and that misled us, and that's why the next episode was about the male ego. Um, but, <laughs> but to me, that was wonderful as a wine idiot. I, I was happy that I got it wrong, because it was a reminder to me that I am not just this cold vessel that collects information that is coming from me. It reminded me that also my mind is going out to that information, and it is interpreting that information based on my experience, my hunches, my, you know, all of these different things. So this moment of going, are you really sure? I mean, it's an important thing about doubt. You know, to me, I would say one of the most important things as a human being is to hold on to your beliefs with a loose grip. Be ready for the evidence to change. Be ready to say, do you know what? I always believed this, but actually, it turns out, nah, that's wrong. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you, now, some of you will know about this experiment, uh, the rubber hand illusion. You know about this, right? There's a lot of... Has anyone done the rubber hand illusion? I saw a kind of smile there of uh, recognition of... The, if you don't know the rubber hand illusion, and, it's, and please do read up on it, because since I was involved in it, there's been more research and as well. But it's just a basic little look at how, again, we piece together our expectations of the world and how our brain, we must always remember, is looking for shortcuts. It's always looking for ways of saving energy. So I was on a train, late night train, and a woman called Haley Drew, who I'd never met before, came up to me and went, hello, I've heard your radio show. I'm a psychologist. Can I do some experiments on you? <laughs> and I always say yes to that. I love it. I genuinely, friends of mine say, why do you always say yes? What if it turns out someone's just, like, someone once came up to him and went, I've heard your radio show, and I think you should have a brain scan. And then they said, sorry, that sounded ruder than I meant. I didn't mean your sentence structure suggested there was something wrong with the apparatus. I just meant I thought you'd have fun doing it. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Here's, here's my email and, uh, and my phone number. And he said, don't you want to check out who I am first? I went, no. Because <laughs> whatever happens, it will be an adventure. You know, even if I just end up in a shed in your garden and I'm lying in a metal bin and you're banging magnets around it saying it really is an fMRI, there's a story afterwards, should I live? So I love saying yes to these things, right? So this one was, I went, it was at Birmingham University where Haley used to be, she's at Durham now. And if you don't know the rubber hand illusion, you can basically see it there. The top hand you can see is actually a rubber hand. That is not my hand. The real hand is the one that you can see is concealed there, the lower hand. 
Now, what Haley would do is, first of all, you sit down, and the rubber hand is just, in fact, it was that hand, it's just placed there. Your real arm there is kind of hidden under that, and you just stare at the rubber hand. Now, after about one to two minutes, about 30% of you will start to have the sensation that the hand that you feel is that rubber hand. That appears to be the position, not your real arm that's there, that rubber arm appears to be, and you, you know, you know it's not your arm, and yet, weirdly enough, you go, that's really weird, it, it kind of feels like that's the position of my hand. Again, it's just taking little shortcuts. Then, Haley ups the ante. What Haley does is she gets out two paintbrushes, and she strokes my hidden hand and the rubber hand in the same direction at the same time. Now, at this point, about 80 to 85% of you, within one to two minutes, would feel a very real experience of the fact that you can feel that brush on the rubber hand. That feels like that is your hand. And it's mesmerizing, and it's discombobulating, and it's exciting. And you're so lost in this reverie of new confusion that you don't notice Haley pull out a hammer and slam it down on the rubber hand, <laughs> at which point you leap up, and she goes, ha ha, you really thought that was your hand, didn't you? And you say, why did you do that? And she says, because I'm a psychologist. So, <laughs> these ways of testing our mind, these ways of testing how we... Th there's another, this one's so simple, you don't need a rubber hand or a hammer for this. This is one you can do tonight, is to go into your bathroom and go and stand before your bathroom mirror. Right? If, if you've got one of those mirrors that just you can illuminate just the mirror, do that. Otherwise, the bathroom light is fine. And all you need to do is you just stare directly into your own eyes. Don't look away. Stare directly into your own eyes. And again, about 80 to 90% of you will find that within one to two minutes, your head appears to visually change. For some of you, your head will start bubbling and pulsating. For some of you, suddenly, it's as if you become ancient, almost mummified. For some of you, your head will seem to start disappearing. And what's happening is you are giving your mind so little feedback that eventually it goes, nothing seems to be going on. We better make some stuff up. <laughs> and by making that stuff up, it wakes you back up and you're sensing the world again. So these, just, these are beautiful little fun tests. Now, I'm, I moved on, I mentioned painting. And this is one of the things I want to, that's a painting by J.M.W. Turner. And uh, it was the first painting of his that I suddenly really loved. You know, there's a moment sometimes there are certain artists that we are so familiar with, we almost aren't looking at their work. You know, it's like Van Gogh's Starry, Starry Night. You know, that's when you look at the Starry Night, you've seen it so many times, but then one day you're in a gallery or an exhibition and you see it, and suddenly you really see it. And this is what happened with that particular painting. It was, it was in a gallery in Liverpool, the Walker Gallery, it's still there. And I just started looking at it and I became mesmerized by it. I became mesmerized by this is a painting of light. This is a painting, this is what he was known for. Almost all of that painting is light. There are the hints of the sky, there we can see the ground beneath, but nearly all of it is bleached out by his experience of light. And I started thinking about that. I started thinking about where does that painting begin? And that painting begins, well, I mean, we, we, we won't go right back to the Big Bang, but we could say if we start in the sun, we start in the sun and we think of hydrogen becoming helium, and as hydrogen becomes helium, that creates photons of light. And some of those photons of light, as they spread out, some of them spread out towards the planet Earth, and some of them moved all the way down to where J.M.W. Turner was standing with his easel, and some of them were reflected off the ground into the back of J.M.W. Turner's eyes, and then he interpreted his experience of the light. Now, what for me is kind of beautiful about that is we can explain almost every part of that story with science and equations, apart from the final bit, imagination, the subjective experience of that light. And I was thinking about this, and it, it led to me, I wrote a poem about that experience. It was about something else as well. A while ago, I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD, 
uh, which I've generally, fortunately for my career, is quite useful. Because I just, I, you know, I dot around, I have lots of different ideas, I get quite, you know, kind of, oh, that's exciting, and that's exciting, and that's exciting. And I just love pouring ideas into my head and just shaking them up and seeing what comes out. I was worried, actually, my wife, I thought, oh, no, if I've got ADHD, my wife will probably think I'm showing off. You know, so I just, I, I waited to tell her because I thought she'd be a bit annoyed. And eventually I said, just so you know, a man called Jamie said that he thinks I have ADHD. And rather than being annoyed, her face lit up. And she went, oh, that would be fantastic because I've always thought you were bipolar. So that was, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I thanked her later on for giving me an effective line when discussing ADHD. And... Um, so I was thinking about this as well, and, and one of the reasons that I, I'm going to say this poem as well is because it's very important not to worry about understanding everything. I think because science sometimes can become very alien to us, because you know sometimes when we're kind of 12 or 13, it can change in school, it can seem to be numbers and symbols. Sometimes it's only the really, really science enthralled who continue doing science, and some of us leave it entirely behind. And I think it's very important you don't like how many people here have interest how many people here have started reading a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking let's just see that's quite a few hands and then keep your hand up if you finished reading it that's quite that, that was interesting because that hand didn't go up for who started reading it but you did finish reading it so I like no 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 that's good that's exactly what I'd have done if you start at the end uh you're just the no 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 but it's it's it's, it's you know it's such I've read it five times and I still don't understand all of it but each time that I read it, there's something else I take away from it. In the same way, if you read a book about quantum mechanics, I mean, one of my favorites is Carlo Rovelli's Helgoland, which I think is magnificent. Now, you won't, you know, very often people finish a book and they go, oh, I didn't understand it all. I must be an idiot. I don't know science. And you go, you shouldn't really understand it all in one fell swoop. Because if you understood it after reading one book, that would be a terrible insult to all those scientists who've had to spend 30 years studying it, and it turned out they just needed to read a Carlo Rovelli book. And then you win the Nobel Prize just because you spent 20 euros on a book. You know, it's kind of... So that bit of not knowing everything is important. So this was... It's, it, like, the few things that I've learned about science, they have changed the sky. That, for me, is... It doesn't just have to be the sky. It's that bit that the more that you find out and the more stories you know, the more you look at the world and it looks a little bit different today because it has another layer of story. So this is the poem that I wrote shortly after the ADHD diagnosis. Last night, a ghost collided with my head. It was the light from something dead. Once it had breathed hydrogen into helium, created a beacon, projected its life across the sky. And some of that life hit me in the eye and expanded my mind. In its size and in its power, it was grander than I could ever be. But it never knew how grand it was. It never knew the awe inspired. It never experienced its existence. There was nothing it was like to be that star, only something it was like to wonder at that star, because the stars cannot marvel at the stars. And Jupiter, too, is without curiosity. Me? I'm small and I'm fragile and I'm easily felled by meteorites or by microbes. But I'm pugnacious, inquiring, tenacious. I can chew on the quandaries of the cosmos. I've got a skull full of pictures and questions and problems, too. I don't like my anxiety, but then I realize it's also my fire, because much that destroys me also creates me. There is something it is like to be me. And it's not always satisfactory. My atoms battle, my molecules revolt. But still, more than the single line of an equation or a solo chemical reaction, confused, confusing, absurd. But flashes of inspiration, and out of my ashes may grow apples. Emergent complexity briefly defeats the void. So it's that thing with just those, the few things that I'd learned about the sky, about the stars, and then about myself, all of those things 
had made the world richer and more fascinating. Oh, I'm going to go back one on this. This is because one of the things that I've, I've talked about in a few of the interviews that I've done while I've been here, and I think this is very important, is don't be scared of asking questions. Don't be scared of approaching poets, science, philosophers, whatever it might be, and asking what you think. I wonder if that question's stupid. Because if it's a question that comes from a real interest, if it comes, if it's a real, it doesn't matter how, you know, most, every time that I've done a tour where afterwards there have been some science questions, someone, the number of times someone will preface, especially if I'm doing a show with Brian Cox, this is probably a stupid question. And it never is. Because it's, you know, it's like that thing, you know, why is the sky blue, as if that's a stupid question. Of course it's not a stupid question. It's an incredible. There's so many different things when we start trying to understand why the sky is blue and the nature of light scattering and the nature of the spectrum and so many other things. So I was, the scariest gigs that I ever do, uh, like, like last year when I was doing a big tour with Brian, we did things like the O2 in London, which is 14,000 people. We, we did 12,000. Know, we were doing these arenas, but that doesn't, I'm quite relaxed in that situation. But two weeks after we played to 14,000 people, I had to go to a primary school and talk to five and six-year-olds about why science is great. And if anyone here is a teacher or a parent, or who's been a child themselves, <laughs> you know that it is children don't hide when they're bored. They don't overtly show it. It's not that they're kind of coughing or heckling. It's that normally this finger here is just going further and further and further up the nose, right? It's, as if they're trying to kind of subconsciously lobotomize themselves. Oh, God, I can't hear any more of this, right? And I really wanted them to be full of wonder, right? Because I, I, yeah, and, and I, and I, I rang up someone who does science communication for kids. And I said, I have, apart from my own son, I haven't talked to five and six-year-olds before about science. What should I talk about? And he said, farting in space. They love that. <laughs> and dinosaur poo, right? And then when I ended that call, I thought, no. This is another problem we have, I think, in so many different societies, which is we don't realize how brilliant and wonderful and curious so many people are. We are often delivered the lowest common denominator. And I thought, these kids are five and six. You know, I'll break out the farting in space if necessary, but I don't think I should talk about that. I think they're, they're going to be, they're so ready to be filled with wonder and delight. So I walked there with the, I think the first session, there were about 25, 26 kids. They're sat cross legs there and uh, they're all waiting. And I walked out and the first question I asked them, I said, Who here has got a brain? And the hand, yeah, I've got a brain. I've got a brain. I've got a brain. Arlo hasn't got a brain. Yes, I have actually. I'm sure Arlo has. Thank you. Good. Let's move on. I said, who would like to see my brain? And at that point, they went, because <coughs> I think they thought I was going to kind of go, press down, twist, here it is, right? And then as you briefly saw, I said, I had a little screen. I said, this is my brain. And that really is my brain, by the way. What you're seeing there is that brain scan that I mentioned. This was the brain scan that I had. And I was very lucky, because I've, I've had three brain scans, and all of them have been for fun, uh, which is definitely the best of the options. And when I first saw that, to me, it was the, it's the, I'm not someone who shows you selfies or, or photographs of myself on holiday, but when I had that, I was like, do you want to see my brain? I've got my brain, do you want to see my brain? That's my brain. And uh, I always got worried because I thought one day I'll be showing it and there'll be someone who goes, I'm terribly sorry, I'm a neurosurgeon. And I think there was something that wasn't picked up. I, you've got two days. But it's... Uh, <laughs> But it was so exciting, and, and I, so I showed the kids that. I said, that really is my brain, and the thing is that, as you've all said, and as you know, you all have brains inside your skull, so you have all the apparatus that is needed to ask questions, to create art and poetry, to look at the flowers with wonder, to start dreaming and wondering if you could be an astronaut. All of those things are available to you with that brain that you have. And then we went off in so many different directions. We talked about the number of stars in our galaxy alone. We talked about the size of the universe. We talked about chimpanzees. We talked about Apollo 11. We just, and there were so many questions. It was meant to be a 20-minute talk. It ended up being a 40-minute talk. And, and it was just... And one of the children afterwards came up to me 
uh, there was a, a little girl called Emily. And she was meant to go out to the playground after the talk. And she went up to her teacher and she went, Mrs. DG, Mrs. DG, please, can I tell the man something? And she went, well, you are really meant to go out and play now. She went, oh, please, can I tell the man something? And she went, all right, you can. And she came up to her, she went, hello, man. Um, have you ever seen the full moon? I said, yes, I have. It's good, isn't it? She went, it's amazing. Do you know why it shines so brightly? Because I can tell you. And she accurately told me why the full moon appears so bright. And that was something that I thought was really wonderful because, again, the older we get, when we're five, when we're six, we're so excited and we don't have that filter that comes from the fear of social shame. And then we get older and that starts to kind of evaporate. We think, I better not ask that question. So that was a very, very beautiful moment. Um, the, uh, that, by the way, is just, I'm not going to talk about that. That's the first ever picture that was taken of me. Uh, I'm the one in the middle at the bottom there. Uh, there's my two older sisters looking on. But again, I was, uh, I've got, oh man, I'm not going to. Ah, sorry, I've just because I know what the time is, and we're about one fifth of the way through. So um, this, I'm just gonna. This is just. I wanted to also talk about. Sometimes pseudoscience is a great. If any of you are as old as me, right? This was one of the most exciting things when I was a child, right? This is genuine footage of Bigfoot. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. It was so cool, right? Look at it. There we go. Oh, they managed to. Get, where's Bigfoot? There he is. That's Bigfoot. Or is it a man in a gorilla costume wearing an American football helmet under the head to bulk it out? I'm afraid it's the latter. So the, um, but I loved, even those kind of things, I loved so much. Now, I'm going to quickly get on to something Roberto was talking about, which is uh, when he was talking about Voyager, talking about that wonderful golden record, which, is, which has, by the way, again, the history of human beings is filled with flaws. Um, amongst the many different sounds and tunes on the golden record is a greeting from the UN Secretary General of the time. So we've sent out to all of the possible extraterrestrials that might find that record a greeting from the UN Secretary General, whose name was Kurt Voldheim, who shortly afterwards was found out to be an ardent Nazi. So, Maybe looking back, we shouldn't have gone with that as a message. Uh, but the rest of it is very good stuff. But the reason is, this is, you probably know about this image. Some of you will know, this is the blue dot image. This was also taken by Voyager. This was when Voyager had just, as far as I remember, passed Neptune. And the reason I wanted to show you this image, this was an image that actually arrived on Valentine's Day. Carl Sagan, whose idea it was, took that image home to his writing friend and his partner and his wife, Andrian, and that was the Valentine's gift. Look, that's the Earth. Now look how tiny it is. And that's just from Neptune, and you think how big the solar system is. And what he wanted, and this is the reason I mention this in particular, is NASA did not want this done. NASA were not interested in the blue dot image. Carl Sagan fought and fought and fought, and eventually they did this. So it swung round and it took an image, and there we see the fragility of us, the tininess of us, uh, a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam, as Carl Sagan said. And then also, as he said, think of all of the bloodshed so men could be the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. So that is such an interesting thing to me because it's the fact that it was not really something they wanted on the itinerary. Now, the next image is one that we saw at the beginning of the day from Roberto's talk, and that is this. We go back to Earthrise. Now, some of you might know that the Apollo 8 astronaut, Frank Borman, died yesterday. He was part of the mission that took that image. And that image, again, was not on the itinerary. The itinerary of Apollo 8 was not to land on the moon, it was to survey the moon, to look at what might be a good landing area for Apollo 11, for, for Neil and Buzz and, of course, Mike just floating not far away. And they were looking at the moon, <laughs> and basically what happened was two of the astronauts, including Jim Lovell, just went, oh, it's a bit disappointing, the moon, isn't it? It's a bit boring. And they actually got slightly bored of looking at the moon. I think they were expecting something better. And then they looked out the window and were taken by surprise and went, wow, that's where we live. And they saw the Earth. And Jim Lovell said, get the colour camera now. 
And that's why that photo, and interesting enough, Frank Borman was actually saying, no, 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 it's not on the itinerary. He said, we need to take this photo. And I've spoken to Apollo astronauts, including the brilliant Rusty Schweikart from Apollo 9 and Charlie Duke from Apollo 16, and, and they have said that in many ways, that image is more important than even standing on the moon because that image, again, gives us a sense of where we are. Um, the, uh, that, by the way, is Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, who does these wonderful things there. That's her in the cupola window. Uh, she's been up on the ISS twice, as far as I remember. I think she's due up again. I just wanted to mention her. She's a great uh, Italian astronaut, really worth following her on any social media you can find. She puts up great images, and she's, a very, she's a, just a fantastic voice. Um, Charles Darwin, again, mentioned earlier on. And uh, Charles Darwin, um, I wanted to briefly mention him, because Charles Darwin was something of a kind of hero of mine, and and uh, I wanted to talk again about inquisitiveness. In fact, one of my favorite phrases in all science writing is from one of the journals that he wrote while he was on the voyage of the Beagle. Now, this is one of the things that we're very lucky with as human beings now is we have access to so many images from around the world. You know, we, we, we go back to Louise's when she was showing you know, that image of a giraffe. Now, of course, you know, now we can see giraffes, we can see lions, we can see tigers, we can see blue whales, we can even see images from beyond the planet Earth. But with Charles Darwin, of course, so much had not yet been explored and so much had not yet been catalogued. And so when he got to the rainforests, he was shocked. He basically pretty much got nature shock. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. He was used to the kind of, you know, the damp pastures of England and the beetles that he found there. But uh, in fact, in the journals, he said, one's eyes attempt to follow the flight of a gaudy butterfly, but are soon distracted by some strange tree or fruit, and then distracted by the peculiar insect that is walking across it. And then he said, today, my mind was a chaos of delight. And again, that's something we need to fight for as much as possible. It's very easy to be dragged down into a kind of a, a mire sometimes of melancholy and hopelessness, but fight as hard as you can every day to find something which is a chaos of delight. Uh, that is uh, not Charles Darwin. Um, that is... <laughs> That's an image from the 1976 horror film Squirm, uh, which I know at least one of you will have seen back there. And the reason I've got that image, it's about some earthworms that get electrocuted in an accident and become psychopaths. Um, it's not entirely required scientifically. But the reason I've got that image is, again, the thing about Charles Darwin, which I love, was that his fascination was for everything. So the last book that he ever wrote having covered some of the most exotic and peculiar creatures, flora and fauna of the world, orchids and the strangest of monkeys, his final book was called The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms with Observation on Their Habits. Now, some of you may think that doesn't sound like a page turner. <laughs> you would be wrong. It is one of the best three books I have ever read about earthworms. And <laughs> it's the only one that's non-fiction, actually. So, um, but what I love is here was a man who now in old age, he, he was that age, basically, the age that you saw before, that was the old man. He started walking around his garden and he started thinking about all the earthworms that were beneath his feet, in the soil below, digesting and aerating the soil. And in this book, it has one of my favorite scientific experiments of all time. At one point, he decided to find out if earthworms could hear. So he tested that by playing the penny whistle to it, so just a little tin whistle, he played that. When he found out that there was no reaction to the playing of the tin whistle, most scientists, I think, at that point would have gone, done that test, earthworms can't hear. But Charles Darwin, as we know, was not the average scientist, so he then got his uh, son, Leonard, to bring in his bassoon and play the bassoon to the earthworms. And then when they found out there was no reaction to the bassoon, they took them in the house and started playing the piano to them. And that is how jazz was invented. Um, but I just 
This is just because I think there was a squid shortage earlier on during the tour. This is one of my, again, the imagination of nature is far greater than the imagination of human beings. I'm sure you all know that. Extra squid bonus points. It's the piglet squid there, which I just think is an absolute delight. And there it is in action. Um, there's Jane Goodall. I, would, I haven't got time to it. Jane Goodall, just, if, look, if you don't know, Jane Goodall was such an important scientist. She wasn't officially a scientist. She did work that was very often kind of ignored and and that some of the kind of the older men of the establishment looked down on what she did and felt she had not done her research properly. But she did her research far. She, it is remarkable. What she found out about chimpanzees, and thus what we find out about ourselves, is something very, very beautiful and very, very important, and something she really had to fight for. But I will, I'll tell you about that at another time, hopefully. Uh, that, by the way, is her. Again, that's an image that is on the uh, golden record, which I love. You've got Jane Goodall at the top, and then the lower one is what aliens are meant to think we do as human beings, which is we just sit, you know, the man sits there doing a painting while the woman toasts a crumpet under a flu. Um, another there, the red lip bat fish, uh, the blob fish. I love that. The sponge crab, that doesn't actually grow a sponge. What it does is when it fears there's some kind of threat, it picks up a sponge and goes, no, I'm not the crab you're looking for. So I love that. Uh, this is... Uh, now, the reason I include this as well is something... Uh, this is something that I argue about with Brian Cox quite a lot. Sometimes I would say to Brian, Ghosts are real. And he'll say, no, they're not. They break the second law of thermodynamics. And I'll say, but this is the problem, is you're saying that ghosts aren't real from a scientific perspective, but ghosts, I think, are real, again, within our imagination. And this is that important thing to make sure that we don't end up in that kind of sci scientism route where we entirely reject all ideas of myth. And, and, and again, some of the things you were saying about there, about, you know, for instance, the indigenous people of Australia, uh, who so much of their science, so much of their understanding of their sky was entirely dismissed. But you don't survive in a territory like that without having an enormous amount of ingenuity and intelligence. And we, I think, very often misunderstood their myths. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for uh, reminding me of this, which is that uh, I think it would have been the 101st birthday of Kurt Vonnegut today, as far as I remember. I just wanted to include Kurt Vonnegut because Kurt Vonnegut, I love science fiction and uh, imaginative fiction. I think it's a great way in to understanding ideas. There's a wonderful place to say, what if? But I also love Kurt Vonnegut. You can see him smoking there, by the way. Some of you will know that when he was 82 years old, he decided that he was going to sue the cigarette brand that he'd been smoking since he was 13 because it had promised that it would kill him with its warning on the packets and had failed to do so. And he was very disappointed by this, right? But what I love about him, there, there is a, a line in The Sirens of Titan. I think, no, it's not, it's, sorry, I apologize. God bless you, Mr. Rosewater. And some of you will know this line, I'm sure. It's the line where the Kurt Vonnegut personality within that book is asked to give advice to all of the babies of the world that might grow up to be 100 years old or more. And he says, I only have one piece of advice for you, and that is, God damn it, you've got to be kind. And that, to me, is part of the journey that also lies within science and our evolutionary understanding of ourselves, that kindness really is a very, very kind of important weapon, an important part of what it is to be a species such as us. There's also, when I went to, I went to Indianapolis uh, last year, and I only had about four hours there, and uh, we, I was on tour with Brian Cox again, and uh, the, the, the van pulled over, and Brian went straight to sleep, and I went straight running down the street to find the Kurt Vonnegut Library, which is what I would always do. He would go and have a sleep in every city we went to, and I would wander around, where's the museum? Where are the bookshops? Where's the art? Where are the bridges? And uh, which explains why, even though we're approximately the same age, we have very different faces. Uh, so he's a great advert for just sleeping in a special privatized oxygen tent. Um, um, oh, he told me not to tell you about that. Um, but I went there, and there was something very, very beautiful at the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library. One of the things that's very important is the library is also not just a memorial of Kurt Vonnegut, it is also a working space for anyone who wants to be a writer. It is a space to be creative and imaginative. And the other thing that, amongst many other things there, there is a letter there. When Kurt Vonnegut went to war, the Second World War, where he had some terrible experiences, just before he went, his father sent him a letter, and he didn't receive that letter. 
The letter was returned to his father. So his father kept that letter throughout the war. And at the end of the Second World War, Kurt Vonnegut fortunately survived. He came home and his father handed him the letter, said, you know, this is the letter I sent you. And Kurt Vonnegut made the decision never to open that letter. That it was always there, to always keep it but never open it. And of course, Kurt Vonnegut has since died. His son Mark has now inherited it. And he too has never opened the letter. I just love, I love again that idea of sometimes there are secrets that are just worth some place for our imagination to stay. Uh, that's Alan Moore. I've only got 57 seconds, so all I'll tell you is Alan Moore is a brilliant writer, a wonderful human being, and wrote the best opening line to a short story about the first femtosecond of the universe in a recent book. So it's a tiny splinter of time. And the first line is, it was the best of times. It was the first of times, which I think is magnificent. Um, he also wrote a book that was longer than the Old Testament. Testament, and when he was asked why he'd written a book so long, he said, so only the strongest can critique me. Um, <laughs> he's a brilliant man and someone really a great understanding of the universe. I will finish uh, just by mentioning, well, there's a, there's a, there was a wonderful playwright, British playwright, a man called Dennis Potter. And Dennis Potter, uh, when he was dying, he did a final interview at five o'clock in the morning, he was drinking morphine because he was in so much pain, and there was something he was asked, this is 30 years ago now, but it stayed with me, and I think it's such an important thing. He, he knew it was his final spring, and the interviewer said, you know, what does the world look like to you now? And he said, I look at the blossom, and it's the blossomest blossom. And that to me is what a perfect, the blossomest blossom. And I think this is an important thing we must remember is not waiting until we know it's our final spring to experience the blossom as the blossomest thing, the leaf as the leafiest leaf, the sky as the skyiest sky and the starriest stars. You know, when I was walking around here today just to, I don't know, during the lunch break and I was looking at the blue flowers growing up through the cracks and I was looking at the brown, all of those things is to make sure that we keep our eyes open, we remain vigilant, we remain curious and we try and make sure that we infect as many people as possible with the wonder of what it is to be a self-conscious creature on a fragile but currently very beautiful planet. Thank you very much.